So before we get started, let's introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is Kenny. I've been working at Spotify uh, for about a year and a half now. I'm on the analytics department, and I work on this team called Analytics Consulting. Essentially what that means is we have two departments at Spotify. There's an analytics team and there's a content team. The content team is responsible for getting the music on the service, et cetera. And I function as the interface uh, between the analytics team and that content part of the business. And I'm Emily. I'm a data engineer at Spotify, and I work on music recommendations. My team does things like Discover Weekly, related artists, and playlist recommendations. Cool. All right, so before we get started uh, talking about BigQuery, maybe it makes sense to give some context around uh, where we've come, actually, uh, from a data infrastructure perspective at Spotify. So ever since the beginning uh, of Spotify, we've always managed our own on-premise Hadoop cluster. This has worked great for us over the past few years, and uh, even most recently, we're kind of famous in that we're the largest, we have the largest Hadoop cluster in Europe. We have about 2,300 nodes, and we run about 11,000 jobs a day. So a lot of work being done there. And historically, this is kind of the model with which we've been able to get data out of our cluster. More recently, we've been experimenting with technologies like Scalding and Crunch uh, for our newer production jobs. But you know, in the past, we, we still have a lot of jobs actually still in production that are still functioning off of the old, out-of-the-box Python MapReduce. That's for stuff that's scheduled most of the time. If we want to do any kind of ad hoc analysis uh, on our data, we typically, our analysts will use Hive, uh, which is a SQL language, uh, essentially. Um, for the more one-off, ad hoc kind of analysis pieces. <clears throat> so yeah, this, we were doing this for a while, and, um, but the problem with this model is it really, there's two main problems, actually, that we're becoming a little bit more than just problems. So the first thing, obviously, as you know, all these things are MapReduce. And if you've ever used MapReduce before, um, it scales great, but the speed of the iteration is actually just incredibly slow. You know, you're writing a query that will take you a few minutes, sometimes hours, depending on how complicated it is. <clears throat> and this speed was just becoming a huge problem. Specifically, um, I'm thinking like maybe it's difficult, it becomes difficult to report on time sensitive asks. And when I say time sensitive, you know, imagine a scenario where like Taylor Swift, you know, you get an email from your boss and tells you that Taylor Swift's taking your music off Spotify. You're like, okay, this is like terrible, I know. But you need to come back with like, metrics within like, the hour, um, telling your boss like, how many playlists she's on. You have to hit PR quick, right? <clears throat> but we can actually do this in a really reasonable way to report on these mission critical pieces because the query takes like an hour. So you know, sure, you could argue that this is just a one-off kind of thing. <clears throat> but as Spotify becomes more and more in the public eye, you know, it's becoming more and more intolerable um, if we're slow to report on these very mission-critical, time-sensitive pieces. So that was becoming a big problem. <clears throat> Next, um, so analytics, we don't just, you know, fight fires all the time. And I don't think analytics organizations necessarily want to do that and spend their time doing that. Ideally, you want to evolve as an organization to conduct, to spend most of your time doing complex, you know, less obvious answers and doing kind of research things. However, the problem with us, the main blocker for analytics to actually evolve into this you know, good data science organization, the main blocker there was just the speed of our technologies that we were using. You, know? you can imagine, sure, we gave this Taylor Swift playlist number, but now your stakeholder wants to come back and say, you know, I want to understand something about the users. Like, <clears throat> can we look at the listeners of Taylor Swift before the takedown, can we look at them after? Can we come up with some story that you know something bad happened with those users? Well, so this is like a you know this analysis, as you know, like there's tons of things you can look at, and it's really unclear exactly what numbers you want to pull at first. Ideally, you want an environment that allows you to iterate quickly and try a bunch of test a bunch of your early hypotheses. You know, maybe we look at their their churn rates. Maybe we look at how they're engaging with other replacement artists. You know, you want to test all of these things. Problem is, you're using this technology where every single query costs you an hour of your time, and you have to really think carefully, and you really don't have the freedom to explore as much as you'd like to. 
And that just really hampers your ability to do these multi-step exploratory analyses. So uh, those were suffering a lot also from the technology. <coughs> Lastly, um, you know, I'm sure everyone who's an analyst has dealt with this before, but you know, we run into a really frustrating situation where you kick off something that was running for several minutes, several hours, et cetera. 95% of the way completes, and it just fails at like some single point um, in the step of the job, you know, hitting a data set that doesn't exist anymore, or some weird thing, schema changed or something. So those, <clears throat> in addition to just being common and really frustrating to an analyst, they also cost the system uh, a lot of resources that we couldn't get back a lot of times. Especially, and this was a headache for our, you know, we're, we're owning everything on premise, and these data infrastructure engineers have to debug where these failures are happening. Especially in the case maybe you have this really bad job that's just croned, you're not really focusing on it, and it's just taking all these resources that you can never get back. And sure, there existed tooling, uh, like, you know, we could write unit tests, we could do things to help prevent these problems, but it wasn't at a state where it was entirely usable, and you know, these, these just failures kept happening. <clears throat> so that's on the speed side. The other main piece that was a huge problem with using this on-premise Hadoop cluster was we needed to maintain a significant amount of tooling to actually make it usable. So you know, <clears throat> especially like not everyone doing analysis has a computer science degree or you know, can write a scalding job. Uh, most of them. Their skill set is more in line with you know, statistics, and they know SQL at best, a lot of cases. So you can't really expect an analyst to be able to you know, SSH into a, an edge node and, and actually like, write this job, kick it off. Um, so we have to build things like internal web UIs that would allow analysts to just go to a website, plug in a, like, write their own SQL query, execute something. But then, you know, this is a product, right? And then now, we have, now we're in a situation where, in addition to all the normal like, data infrastructure things we have to manage, there's, we're actually creating products now for internal use that have all the problems and overhead and resource constraints that come with a product. You know, we have these web UIs that we have to maintain. And you know, we have to continue like, logging and monitoring uh, the usage of this, and as well as the machines that we're provisioning. You know, there's other harder problems. If you write a query in this web UI and you want to get millions of rows back, how do we actually send that back to the, to the end user? So all this stuff is largely, you can imagine, a fixed responsibility um, if we want to use this on-premise cluster. And you know, we're investing really talented, hardworking engineers uh, maintaining all this stuff that maybe we don't actually need. <coughs> so. Um, we needed a platform really to solve these problems, and uh, BigQuery very early on actually uh, jumped out as a really great solution. Uh, particularly, um, number one, to address these two problems of speed and, and tooling. One, it was just incredibly fast. I remember still actually there was like a really small group of analysts uh, who were given like first access at Spotify to give the tool a try, and it was just like awesome. Being able to see, like, you know, getting used to querying this one data set that would take you, you know, being used to waiting 15, 20 minutes for this to run, and then suddenly getting results back through BigQuery within like 10 seconds. That was just amazing to me and super inspiring and really like got me excited about all the new th analyses that I could do. <clears throat> it's still in SQL, so there's no learning curve. Um, for an old analyst on the old model. They could jump right into the tool and get started immediately. And again, more importantly, back to the, to the piece of the maintenance piece, there's just no more infrastructure to manage. You know, we were spending all these engineers maintaining this stuff. Now they were essentially freed up with, if, you know, if we decide to go with BigQuery, they were freed up, and we could use them on more important projects. <clears throat> so we gave it a try, and Here's an example of kind of how it's implemented. Uh, from an access perspective, it's also really easy. Just it was really easy for us to just get started and using it, just get started using the tool. So we use um, perm permissions and access all done through Google Groups. Really simple and kind of the workflow now is you enter. It, you can imagine if you're starting as an analyst, you enter this group and you get this one project for free uh, called Data Commons. So right now we're basically uh, just have this big 
project that has a bunch of our core data sets that have, you know, these data sets are owned by teams. You know what's in them. You can trust the data. Uh, they're like very core to doing any kind of analysis at Spotify. So you get that for free. <clears throat> and then we're, basic, we're also organizing uh, projects according to specific teams. So you can imagine a team that's working on uh, like a running feature could have their own project called running that gives them, in addition to their own sort of like little, little sandbox that would allow them to upload whatever ad hoc data sets they want to look at just for analysis purposes, ad hoc debugging purposes, they could have the freedom to do that uh, without mucking up and like ruining the experience of data commons for the larger analysis at Spotify community. <clears throat> and as far as actually getting the data, this is kind of what it looks like. Um, we still have a lot of our jobs writing to HDFS. So um, pretty regularly, uh, we, have, we have a pipeline that's pushing stuff from HDFS into GCS. From there, that's where BigQuery is calling from. And you know, most use cases, we just use the out-of-the-box web UI that comes with BigQuery. That's like really easy to use, really easy to get started with. Um, that probably solves 90% of the use cases of like our analysts who just want to write a SQL query, hit a button, and get results back. Really easy to do that. <clears throat> we also, however, there's like also this use case. We use uh, Jupyter a lot within the analytics community. That's like this. Um, Kind of like, it's like if you've ever used IPython Notebook, um, it's basically the iteration of that. Nice little like, place that allows you to share work and marry your code with actual result sets. So yes, uh, so we actually, we, we actually wrote uh, a few plugins within Jupyter that would allow us to directly query uh, from our BigQuery data sets within this environment that we were used to. Sure, we could have used a tool uh, like Google Data Lab, which we saw earlier actually today. Um, as like an alternative to a notebooking environment, as an alternative to Jupyter. But I mean, at the time, we were already so used to, you know, it was nice that we didn't have to sacrifice our existing environment and our existing familiarity with Jupyter. Um, and we could very easily actually like flexibly still adapt that environment into this new data model. So yes, Data Lab would have been, I think it could be a solution as well. But at the time, you know, we were using Jupyter, and we decided to go down this route, and it was OK as well. So now the data is all there, and it's implemented. Um, but then the next piece was, it, right, like how are you actually going to get uh, people at Spotify to actually go out and use all of this work that has been already done? So from this business onboarding perspective, the way we solved this problem was just a lot of workshops, in-person workshops on BigQuery. So this started, where, this started with uh, like a whole day on site with Google New York. We had some of the BigQuery team come to our office and sit with this like early pilot group of 10 or so analysts, uh, go over sort of the guts of how it worked. They were even nice enough to like sit down with us and actually debug some of the queries and answer very specific questions that we were having. After that, uh, a lot of us uh, in this early test group went out to the rest of the company and the rest of the analysis community and shared a lot of our learnings directly in, in sort of informal workshops with coworkers. This was, I thought, crucial to actually getting, you can imagine there's a lot of old school analysts who are just like used to Hive and that's just like what they know. And they're not gonna really switch their behavior unless you actually go out and talk to them and show them the upsides. Like, here is an example of what you do now. <clears throat> Here's why it's better in BigQuery. So those were really essential to getting some of the older coworkers or like more veteran coworkers moved over to this new platform. And now it's like actually really great to see that for all new employees today uh, in the onboarding process, we basically just start with BigQuery. And it's been really easy and a really smooth onboarding process, specifically because of like the speed piece of it. Um, our analysts can really just get into the tool and into the web UI immediately, mess around with a data set query, and really get a very quick familiarity of what our data looks like. <clears throat> On a more ongoing basis, uh, we've done a good job, I think, of creating a, good, a strong learning culture at Spotify. We have very active Slack channels. That's typically the first place for a new BigQuery user to go and ask a question. If that doesn't work. Uh, we typically point people to the BigQuery docs, which are really solid. If you haven't looked at them yet, like huge improvement over like the Hive docs, if you've ever looked at them before. Um, 
solve most of, basically most of our questions that we have. And the Stack Overflow community has also has been actually pretty responsive as well. <clears throat> so maybe to give it a little bit more color, um, here's some examples of real life, uh, you can imagine, recurring business data requests that Spotify faces with. And here's some numbers to show you the you know, 35x and more up, like basically improvement in efficiency that BigQuery has given to us. So I'm just going to give you an example. Like number one, KPI. So you can imagine like somebody wants to get KPIs by specified parameters. You know, some marketer, some marketing person wants to know the MAU of Spotify in Brazil among 18 to 24 year olds, right? So this is a ad hoc query. Uh, it requires an analyst to write something and and, and pull data. In the Hive scenario, you know, you'd write this, you'd maybe leave, go do something else, come back. In the new world with BigQuery, you can write this and you get results basically immediately and it's over. And basically, you know, this is a huge up, upside as well because you can imagine you'd want to pull KPIs very often. This is a, could be a very daily recurring request that we can do now in 10 seconds. <laughs> maybe the same marketer wants to go out and be like, okay, I want to do this social targeting campaign in Australia. I want, give me like, all the super fans of Foo Fighters or something, and I want to give them an email, like, you know, here's this concert, and, you know, do this targeting thing. I want some emails. Well, when they net normally ask an analyst for that, you know, again, this is very specific. You'd have to write some Hive job for it, take a long time. <clears throat> you know, now that we have all the speed with BigQuery, we can do more and more of these, these really targeted campaigns. Lastly, like top tracks. So top tracks we refer to internally as kind of our, it's our word count, essentially problem at Spotify. It's like the bread and butter analysis question. <clears throat> so you can imagine like a label person comes to you and wants to know the top tracks of Justin Bieber among like 55 year olds. This is the only job by the way where like that's not weird. Like you, you pull this like all the time and it's like no one even look, no one even asks you twice. You just like, that's my job. I pull Justin Bieber tracks, I guess. But yeah, like Hive, I mean, that takes essentially a day. And now with BigQuery, um, you can deliver on these reports, again, instantaneously and just save yourself so much time going forward. So these uh, largely, again, are, are, more, are, are examples of more recurring like day-to-day -day, uh, business wins that we've gotten from BigQuery. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Emily now, and she's going to go over um, two really powerful examples of longer term projects that we were really able to leverage the platform of BigQuery and get really great efficiency upsides. So take it, Emily. Thanks, Kenny. Because of the ease of use and the speed that we've gained with BigQuery, we were able to solve two problems that we we're facing at Spotify. One is around what we call audience insights. And this is looking at how users are actually interacting with our service. And the other one is around evaluating A-B tests. But first, I'll go over audience insights. We have a lot of teams at our company like marketing and growth and ad sales. And they have a lot of questions about what are users doing on our service. They ask things like, how many free users between the age of 18 and 30 listen to hip hop in the US? What platforms do these hip hop fans like to use? And how do these platform habits differ from all free 18 to 30 year olds in the US? Before using Hive in our old system, getting this information and answering these questions, it was a really manual process. It involved a lot of time on the analyst end, just pulling the data together and writing these jobs. And then the analysts would spend a lot of time waiting for a Hive to complete. So it was just a, took a lot of time to answer these questions. The information was scattered around our system. You might need to be an expert on where to find information about our users, where is it stored, or know somebody who is an expert. So it's hard just to gather all the information together. And finally, we had a lot of Band-Aid solutions. We had analysts who would put together dashboards with no clear SLA, and then they would leave the company. So it was unclear whether we could rely on these dashboards anymore or how to update them. We also tried using some third-party solutions, 
But this again involved a lot of manual intervention on the analyst's part because they'd have to gather up all this data and send it over to the third party to process. And then in the end, we'd wind up having the numbers from the third party dashboards and the numbers in our own dashboards, they weren't in agreement. So it was just kind of a mess. So we decided once we got BigQuery, we could build this web app that we called Audience Insights. And I'll go over how it works. So it's a web page that people can go to and choose a bunch of different parameters, like whether they want to look at people in the US or in other countries, what ages they want to look at, just different demographic features. Once they have chosen all of those filters, a request gets made. If we've already answered that request before, it's in our cache, and we return the answer quickly. So this just uh, increases, or this makes it, uh, the request a lot faster. But if it's not in our cache, we have this Python API that turns that request into up to 15 different queries that run on top of BigQuery. Initially, because we were running so many queries at once, the getting the results was kind of slow, but we decided to have dedicated computing slots to field all of these queries, and that improved the turnaround time. And I'll show you what this looks like with some mocked up data. Here's one graph where you can see users by age and gender. So you can just see this breakdown. There's also streams by genre. So if you want to look at what are the top genres that people are streaming, you could see here that pop and metal are our most popular genres on Spotify. And finally, if you want to dig even deeper, you can look at how are people actually streaming things in terms of are they streaming from their own collection? Are they streaming from their saved playlists? Are they listening to radio, Discover Weekly? You can really get a deep dive into how users are interacting with our service. What's great about this is that you know, now we can field all these different questions from people, and they feel really empowered, because now they can go to this website and get the information themselves, rather than having to go to an analyst and wait a while and have this analyst spend a lot of time answering these questions. So we freed up a lot of time for our analysts, and we've empowered different teams at Spotify to answer their own questions. And now I'll talk about how we use BigQuery for evaluating A-B tests. I have a screenshot here of the Spotify homepage. You can see there's a bunch of different shelves, like recently played and popular playlists. But we want to test different content to our users, and we want to see, are they engaged with this different content? You know, what if we showed different genres or charts? We want to run a lot of experiments and see our users seeing a lot of our content. Are they scrolling down? Are they streaming things? Once they start streaming, do they stream for a while? Before getting the answers to these questions, it was a really manual process. Just like with audience insights, an analyst would be involved for every A-B test. They would have to gather up all of this data, run these Hive queries. It was just really involved. But once we got BigQuery, we decided to leverage its speed and its ease of use to build a tool for evaluating A-B tests. We started off using Scalding to clean up our data and to join our different data sets together. This was just work that really couldn't be done in BigQuery, so we decided to do it in Scalding. And it's something that you could do in Dataflow, but our team was familiar with Scalding, so we just kind of went with that first. Once we had this cleaned and joined up data, we put that into BigQuery. We experimented with a bunch of different schemas, but ultimately we decided that the rawest form of the data would be best. And because of that, now we can have these scheduled queries that run that aggregate up the data. And we did this so that if any of our metrics change, if we decide we want to look at something different, we don't need to actually change any of the scalding jobs. We can just add some new um, scheduled queries. What's also really great about having our data in BigQuery is that it's easier to find data issues. Sometimes things come up, there's like a logging issue, data just looks weird. And now, instead of having to write scalding jobs or look in data in HDFS, we can really quickly run some queries and see where things are going wrong. So it's been great for us for debugging as well. Now that we have this data in BigQuery and we have our metrics, 
we use Tableau to actually visualize our A-B testing results. And what's been great about this is we have these dashboards now where if you run an A-B test, we have this visualization that you just get for free. And the, any new tests just automatically flow through here because it's connected to BigQuery. And it's really empowered our teams to run their own A-B tests and get the results and make decisions without having to have an analyst involved every time. So again, just like with Audience Insights, we really empowered teams to iterate fast and answer their own questions. And now I'll switch over to the demo. So this is a Tableau dashboard that one of our analysts has set up around evaluating A-B tests for the home page. So let's say, for example, we you know, made a test around the um, recently played strip that I showed you guys, and we want to look at how it's doing. You could pick different tests here. There's only one for the demo. Again, this is all mocked up data. You can choose what dates you want to look at and then whether this is a test for new users or not. We have a bunch of different tabs. Here is an overview tab where you can look at how the different content is doing in your test. We have the percentage of total impressions at the top here. So this is just what are people actually seeing on the home page. And we have the percentage of total streams 30 seconds. So are people actually streaming things once they see it? We can see here for recently played that for the test, there's 20% of the total impressions, but only 15% of the total streams 30 seconds. And for control, there's around 13% of the total impressions and 14% of the total streams 30 seconds. So just from looking at this dashboard, we can see that something in the test is causing people not to stream once they have impressions. We also have this conversion map where we have different metrics on the x-axis and the y-axis. On the x-axis, we have impression to stream conversions. So once somebody actually saw something on the home page, did they actually listen to it? And on the y-axis, we have streams to long session conversions. Once somebody actually streams something, did they listen for a while? And you can see here the different bubbles. We have them broken out by this different content types. And any bubbles that are in the top right, that means they have the highest engagement. So we can look here at different content types, like editorial. You can see the test is more engaging than control. And for recently played, you can see that control is a lot more engaging than the test. And if you want, you can you know, only look at certain things in here. You can look by different uh, types of content. So for example, I chose URI type. This is looking at things like, are users listening to radio? Are they listening to charts? Are they listening to albums? Like, which types of content are more engaging? And here's a deeper dive into those URI types. You can see here we have three different metrics. There's impression to long sessions, impression to stream conversions, and streams to long session conversions. You can see here, if you looked at recently played, how the different URI types are performing. You can look at radio and see that for the control, radio is much more engaging on all metrics than the test. But for something like charts, there's really not much of a difference. This is just another way of slicing up the data. We have average streams. And we have it broken out by different content types. So we have recently played, popular, and editorial. And right now, we're looking at this broken up by registration date. So when users signed up to our service, how engaged are they with this different content? You can break it up by gender, by financial product, so whether people are free or premium users. You can see the breakdown by country, and also by age group. So you get a, like, um, a really good view into how your test is performing and can really do a deep dive and slice deeply into this data. And then finally, at the end, you need to decide whether you want to roll out this test or to roll it back. 
So we have this decision-making chart. You could see the different content types and how they're performing overall. And these are statistically significant results. You can see here that for editorial, the control and the test is really, it's hard to tell. There's not really much difference of how it's performing. For personalized, it's pretty obvious that the test is performing better than control. But for popular and recently played, the tests are performing poor, poorly. And this is for stream to long session conversions. We can look at impressions to stream conversions and see the same thing. And if we want to look at the test overall, you can see that the test is performing a lot worse than the control, so we probably don't want to roll this out. And now I'll switch back to the slides. So th again, this has been a tool that has really empowered people at our company to run A-B tests and really to iterate fast. And it's just given them a way to make decisions about their own A-B tests without involving an analyst for every single one. And now I'll turn it back over to Kenny. Great. Thanks, Emily. So yeah, I hope, uh... Am I on? Yeah. Uh, so I hope uh, this has been great. This has been informative in the kinds of like, real world business problems that we've been able to solve with BigQuery. Uh, to recap, in addition to sort of the recurring uh, daily data delivery kind of stuff that analysts are responsible for delivering on, in, in addition to just improving the efficiency of those queries across the board. Uh, like Emily basically showed us, you know, the, the, the speed with which that we were able to operate with BigQuery essentially like fundamentally changed how the company actually thought about A-B tests and how they, how they looked at the results after launching A-B tests, which is just huge for us. And, um, you know, it wouldn't have been possible without the upsides that BigQuery was able to provide. So judging from all this stuff, uh, you know, it's maybe, you know, we, we're really excited about it clearly, um, personally, but, you know, it's maybe not, BigQuery specifically is maybe not as mainstream at Spotify as we'd want it to be. So over the next, as, our, as, as far as, like, next steps, we're still continuing to spread adoption of BigQuery across the company, especially as we're hiring more people. Initially, as you saw, you know, uh, for example, when Emily was talking about uh, A-B tests, uh, the scalling piece uh, that had to occur before we actually built this Tableau dashboard, you know, maybe as a next step, we also want to investigate other tools within the GCP suite. Uh, you know, maybe Dataflow is a better fit in that piece and can replace scalding. I also talked about earlier how we, we actually still use Jupyter um, as, our notebook frame, as our notebook environment, maybe uh, we want to invest more time looking into Data Lab and even Data Studio, which we saw today, which was really awesome, uh, as, potential, as potential next steps for our environments. Audience Insights uh, is, is, you know, it's worth mentioning that it's the very first app uh, at Spotify that we built on top of this new platform. It's been hugely successful already, and we're going to want to continue to make more apps like Audience Insights. Um, again, just so we can continue to empower people with data who are not necessarily technically, who are not analysts, and free up time for our analysts as well to do more exploratory analyses. Lastly, it's just worth mentioning, uh, Spotify is actually, as on the company level, we're taking on this new mission called Data First, which is becoming a top company bet. What that means is that the whole company is caring about this concept of defining what does it mean to be a data first company in today's day and age? You know, what kind of sub projects can we do to achieve this mission? So here's kind of a taste of what this top company bet looks like for Spotify and what our future looks like. You know, you can imagine we have a team working on defining our key metrics for the company. You know, these are the metrics that allow us to assess the health and allow our board and our lead team to assess the health of our of our business. <clears throat> and you know, this team would theoretically come up with those metrics and also standardize the way with which new functional leaders or new project leaders want to select baskets of metrics to evaluate their work. So we want to go ahead and standardize and just add more rigor to that process. We're doing things like re-examining re how we organize and store our data, right? Like as we move into this new cloud partnership, it's about maybe it's a really good time for us to actually sit down, with, sit down and actually rethink, you know, is our data model still working? Does it still make sense today as it did you know, several years ago when we first came up with it? 
We're also doing things like uh, launching this program called Data University internally at Spotify. This is uh, a well thought out curriculum that we that largely internally brainstormed and thought up of end to end. That's several weeks long, intended for engineers who want to get more interested into the data, uh, basically get more interested within big data. So the goal of this kind of program is just to level up the quality of data engineering uh, at the company among all of our engineering community. And depending you know, on how successful that goes, you know, we might even consider open sourcing this and, and really officially becoming a thought leader in this area. So to, to just wrap it up, if, in, if all of these early successes and all of these early wins are any indication um, of you know, working with, are an early indication of working with GCP, we're just increasingly more confident and more inspired that Spotify is going to continue to become uh, a top data company within our industry. So thank you again for coming. <laughs>